Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, on this beautiful day. And it's uh, the start of what's going to be a really exciting week, having Prime Minister Kishida here. And I want to say thank you for all of you for coming. Delighted to have you here. Um, uh, let, let me just say, it's uh, last week we released a report the, in the Nye Armitage series. I would recommend you take a look at it. But it's looking at the next step we can take in strengthening this alliance. Um, and it's a remarkable accomplishment. And these last years with Prime Minister Kashida have been really a high point. It's really been remarkable what's been accomplished during his tenure. And we're really excited to have him here, especially having a, uh, a speech in front of the joint session of the Congress. That's really rare. And so it's an exciting time. Um, we uh, were very fortunate to have, uh, have two ambassadors here, Ambassador Yamada and Ambassador Rahm Emanuel. They, uh, they've been working pretty hard for the last three weeks, I, you know, and they look pretty good. Although I think uh, Yamada-san said he was out running on the marathon or, over the weekend, so you know, okay, that's, uh, that explains a lot why he's fit and trim. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we're really excited to have them here. They know exactly what's going to happen in this summit, okay, because everything's worked out. And they know it. I don't know how much they're going to share with us, but I suspect it's going to be a pretty good session. And uh, it's going to be a conversation led by Chris Johnstone, who leads our Japan program here. So can I ask you, with your very enthusiastic applause, welcome Ambassador Yamada and Ambassador Robin Mann. Thank you, Dr. Hamry. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Emanuel, Ambassador Yamada, for joining us. And thanks to all of you for, for being here today. I'm Chris Johnstone, the Senior Advisor and Japan Chair here at CSIS. So we'll have a sort of 30 minute or so conversation up here and then try to open things up for a question or two at the end. Um, so let me start. Um, this is the first official visit of a Japanese Prime Minister to the White House since Abe Shinzo in 2015. These visits are a big deal. Right? I think this is only the fifth that the Biden administration has done since it took office. Uh, and they're a prime opportunity to showcase progress in the relationship and, uh, and highlight the importance of the alliance. So I'd like to offer each of you the chance to make some opening remarks. Um, what can we expect? What's the significance of the visit? And Ambassador Emanuel, if I may, let me start with you. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank CSIS for hosting this and for hosting the conference. So I would start um, kind of my I think that the White House or the general view of the administration is that you have uh, both countries under major, major change in the last two years. And so it kind of signifies that one, a closing of one era and the beginning uh, of writing the first chapters of the next era. Japan, on their account, has had in the last two years five different 70-year-old or multi-decade policies that have all changed manifested by the defense budget going from 1% to 2%, counter-strike capability, lifting the cap on defense technology, exports, not only normalizing but stabilizing the relationship with the ROK. Then you have, on the U.S. side of the ledger, a significant change of theory, strategy, from a hub-and-spoke to a lattice system. And I think, in fact, this week we're sitting here in the South China Sea, you have the United States, Philippines, Japan, and Australian, uh, obviously, navies and uh, operations doing a kind of a practice. And then at the end of the state visit, in the break, you have the first ever leaders trilateral meeting between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines. I don't think that's kind of like a bookend with the state visit in, uh, in the middle. That tells you a lot about how the U.S. approach has changed. And then when you kind of project forward, um, from the administration standpoint, as you said, we've had the Australian ROK, you've had uh, the Indian uh, leaders, and now uh, the Japanese leaders. Four of the five state visits have all come from the Indo-Pacific area. And the constant, though, for the United States in this lattice strategic architecture is Japan. And while we've talked about defense and everything else, I do want to say one thing that's very valuable for the relationship. If you look at any of the public uh, surveys in the region, ASEAN countries, et cetera, Japan's standing is the highest of any nation. That's a huge amount of political goodwill and capital that comes to the alliance as we're working the diplomatic front, the development front, let alone the collective deterrence front in the region. And so 
I do think that our efforts here in this state visit is really kind of comes at a, not only a critical juncture in the area, but also in, the, uh, if you look at it from a historical context, it's writing the first chapter of the future. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Yamada. Thank you. First, uh, Chris, thank you for, uh, very much for doing this. And I'm very much honored to be here with Ambassador Emmanuel. You know, I, I, I think I'm relatively energetic, but I, can, uh, I, I don't think I can ever be more energetic than Ambassador Emmanuel. And he's I don't so, recommend it. <laughs> he is so energetic and active. So, you know, wherever we go, not only in Japan, but here in Washington, D.C., we can sense the presence of Ambassador Emmanuel. So thank you very much for all the work you are doing for the partnership. And Prime Minister Abe is arriving later this afternoon. And the, uh, sorry, did I say Abe? <laughs> Prime Minister Kishida. <laughs> I'm sorry. Prime Minister Kishida is arriving late, later this afternoon on an official visit. And as you said, the Japanese Prime Minister's official visits uh, are once in a decade event. So I'm very fortunate to be here as the ambassador when a prime minister visits uh, uh, the United States as uh, official guest of the president. And the last official visit by a Japanese prime minister was uh, in 2015, Prime Minister Abe. And the international situation surrounding the two countries and also, therefore, the nature of the partnership have changed significantly from that time. You know, uh, Prime Minister Abe's visit focused on the 70th anniversary of the end of the war and regional cooperation our two countries had. Um, but, you know, they talked about, the Prime Minister and President Obama uh, talked about TPP and also free and open in the Pacific. But this time around, we are faced with a sort of a turning point in our history. Uh, facing serious challenges, including uh, Russian aggression into Ukraine, uh, situation in the Middle East, and severe and complex security situation in East Asia. And Japan has been very clear and firm in standing up against any attempts to change the status quo or any violation uh, of the fundamental principles of the international order. And Japan has also played an important role in uh, coordinating G7 effort to support the Ukrainian people's effort to defend themselves, as Japan had the G7 presidency last year. You know, Japan has been active in many other global issues in close coordination with the United States. So I think the Japan-U.S. partnership has grown out of a regional partnership and now has become a true global partners, uh, working together to uphold and strengthen a free and open international order based on the rule of law. And I hope the Prime Minister's visit this time around will uh, demonstrate this uh, strong global partnership because not too many people in this country, or not too many people in Japan, for that matter, are aware of this global nature of our partnership and great potential our partnership has. So uh, I very much hope that uh, Prime Minister's visit will impress upon the people in this country and also in Japan and the international community that we are strong global partners. And our partnership has a much larger potential and this you know, strong partnership is based on the uh, trust between our two leaders. But I think more important stable basis for that strong partnership is the sense of trust between our two peoples, nurtured through many years of grassroots exchanges, people-to-people -people exchanges, um, business partnerships, academic exchanges, and other grassroots exchanges. And I am a strong believer in that kind of people-to-people -people exchanges. And Ambassador Emmanuel talked about Japanese reputation in Southeast Asia. I was very much uh, encouraged to see a recent opinion poll conducted by Gallup in this country earlier this month, no, earlier this year. There, uh, people from 50 states and DC were asked whether 
they have favorable views of a country or unfavorable view of that country. The country which came at the top of the favorable view was, of course, Japan. <laughs> that was you know. not a trick question. <laughs> and also, the country which came at the bottom of the unfavorable view is, again, Japan. So there is a strong sense of sort of a support and affinity uh, with Japan by uh, the people in this country. And I hope uh, the Prime Minister's visit will be a celebration of this strong uh, global partnership, which is supported by not only the uh, trust relationship between the two leaders, but also the strong trust between our two peoples. But in addition to just celebrating the today's partnership, the uh, two leaders will also talk about uh, the, that the two countries are indispensable partners to each other in strengthening our competitiveness toward the future. The two uh, leaders will talk about the cooperation in such areas as space, energy, and emerging technologies like AI, quantum computing, fusion, 5G. And the, I, I, I am uh, personally very much excited about the space cooperation, and I know Ambassador Emmanuel is even more excited. And uh, Japan is the foremost partner in the Artemis uh, program for lunar exploration. And we are building a pressurized lunar rover, which will move around on the lunar surface. And the two leaders will uh, talk about the progress we are making in this uh, part uh, or on, the, on, on this issue. So I, I am very much excited about the Prime Minister's visit, which will celebrate this strong global partnership between our two countries. Terrific. And it really is remarkable how far this relationship has come over the last couple of decades. Um, so let's get into a bit of the substance, if we can. You noted, Ambassador Yamada, how, how our relationship is now global in its scope in terms of cooperation. And while it's a beautiful spring day outside, it's sort of a gloomy world out there right now. And in particular, you think about war in the Middle East, uh, the stalemate in Ukraine. Um, I wonder if you can share how the leaders will, will address these issues. And uh, Ambassador Emanuel, sort of, will there be things that President Biden is seeking from Japan? And what will Prime Minister Kishida be seeking from the United States as we think about these glo challenging global issues? Ambassador Emanuel? Well, let me, uh, before I get to the two kind of situations, I actually think the larger context da dating back to the two big changes over the, uh, in both countries over the last two years, I, I think you're going to look back when p history gets written that three C's changed the world. COVID, conflict, and coercion. And in many ways, whether you look at the kind of changes on the security front that Japan's initiated, through the prism of what happened when you looked at supply chains, you looked at Russia's violating the United Nations resolution, which they're a founding member of, of a sovereign nation. Uh, you look at all these contacts, you look at what, not only what COVID did, but the economic coercion, as recently on Japan as well, on the uh, fish from the uh, waters. Countries are making adjustments to these three factors that upended every assumption you had for the last 30 years, if not longer. So that's uh, the first one. Second is, in Ukraine right now, it's very clear that Russia is not only targeting the population, or the military, but also uh, targeting the energy infrastructure of the ability for Ukraine as a society to function. No, gr no country has been a greater contributor to the energy infrastructure uh, than Japan. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Kawasaki Heavy Industries have all been uh, exporting major energy transformers to Ukraine. They have been a leader in the economic assistance uh, joining the United States. And so there will be a discussion, obviously, uh, between the two leaders, both, uh, I think, also privately, uh, that will talk about not, uh, those two conflicts without talking about more until they meet. I, I think that would, those are the, the type of things that, there's a lot of other things that happen in these type of visits that are scripted. That's going to be where you have fresh exchange of ideas, and neither one of us have to be, we'd be lying to you if we told you exactly what's going to happen, because I think they're going to bring their individual perspective. and. Today, what you know is happening by Wednesday in both of those situations could be real different. Mm -hmm. 
But I do think the history somewhat will tell you about the future, what both countries have brought. And also, Congress is coming back in session. And you have Congress's, the eyes of the world, as it relates to the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, the eyes of the world are the United States House of Representatives. Mm. And I'll take one note there, or two notes, and I'll be quick here, because I want to make time. Is One is, when the Senate was debating it, 10 of the US ambassadors in the region all wrote a letter how important getting the Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan aid out was important to the region and the credibility. That is also true uh, today for the House. Uh, as Prime Minister Kishida said in Singapore at the conference two years ago, infamously, uh, Ukraine today Indo could be Indo-Pacific tomorrow. These are not a transatlantic and a Pacific theater. They're a single strategic theater they're going to be approached that way. Right. I want to come back to this question of the Prime Minister's speech to Congress in a minute, but uh, Ambassador Yaman, anything you'd like to say about sort of cooperation on these challenging global issues, the Middle East, Ukraine? Uh, as I said, you know, as global partner of the United States, uh, Japan will be working and has been working very closely with the United States on various issues on the Ukraine. As Ambassador Emmanuel said, Prime Minister's conviction is that today's Ukraine could be tomorrow's East Asia. So from that conviction, Prime Minister has been very firm in you know, our support for Ukraine and introducing stronger sanctions against Russia. Uh, recently, we organized a conference in Tokyo uh, to support uh, Ukrainian economic uh, development and as well as reconstruction. And that's, uh, involved, that involved many Japanese private uh, companies. And there was enthusiasm about Jap uh, among Japanese companies to be involved in the reconstruction of Ukraine. So Japan will continue to support uh, Ukrainian effort to defend themselves and, and keep their economy going. And yes, that may be uh, one of the uh, important issues the Prime Minister and the President will talk about. I cannot uh, say exactly what they are going to talk about. And the other issue may be the situation in the uh, Middle East. Uh, not too many people are aware, but Japan has been very uh, uh, active in supporting the uh, Middle East peace process. Um, we have been uh, uh, taking uh, sort of a unique contribution, making a unique contribution to the process by, for example, establishing agro-industrial complex in Jericho to support uh, Palestinian people's economic activities. And also, we organized a conference uh, mobilizing East Asian countries uh, in support of uh, uh, peace process and the Palestinian development. We called the conference as CPAD, Conference on East Asia Nations uh, for Palestinian Development, I guess. But uh, that is a unique role Japan has been playing uh, in the Middle East peace process. And we are more than happy to play a larger role in the discussion of the day after. So that kind of uh, issue, uh, I'm sure uh, the two leaders will have a chance to discuss. Great. Good. Well, let's turn to China now. Secretary Yellen. <laughs> now that we took care of those two. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's an easy, easy yeah. menu of things uh, out there. Yeah. Got that under control. Let's go to China. <laughs> Secretary Yellen has been in China the last few days, uh, where she's focused on a whole range of challenging issues in the U.S.-China relationship, but in particular, uh, this problem of state-subsidized overcapacity dumping in sectors like batteries, um, solar panels, uh, et cetera. So I, I'm wondering how, what you can share about how the President and the Prime Minister would talk about the economic relationship with China and whether there'll be new, any new initiatives to be announced related to coordinating our approaches to managing these very challenging issues. Ambassador Yamada, maybe this time I'll start with you, if that's okay. Um, I do not prejudge what they are going to discuss, as I said, but uh, China is one of the issues, uh, I'm sure, in, uh, in their mind, when they have in-depth discussions. And the economic uh, matters, especially economic security, is one of the issues they discuss. And as Ambassador Emmanuel said, uh, the Japan uh, has been uh, from time to time uh, victims of Chinese economic coercion. At this time, uh, China is introducing uh, unreasonable uh, import ban on Japanese uh, fishery products. 
So uh, as we discuss uh, China, uh, economic security matter is uh, one of the important issues, but also the overall, <coughs> sorry, overall approach to China uh, is another uh, issue that the leaders, I'm sure, will discuss. And the Japanese uh, policy is try to establish a constructive and stable relationship with uh, China through candid, candid communication with the Chinese leadership. And that uh, overall uh, sort of a concept, how to uh, maintain or manage our relationship with China is, I think, shared uh, uh, between the prime minister and the president. And as, as was demonstrated by the president's recent uh, telephone conversation with President Xi Jinping, uh, the press uh, readout indicated that the conversation was very candid. And the Pre uh, Secretary Yellen's visit also, the readout indicates that she made uh, the U.S. positions very clear. And I think it is important as we uh, try to manage our relationship with China that we uh, maintain our you know, principled position. We make it, our concerns very clear to the Chinese and at the same time, uh, encourage the China, uh, Chinese side to take you know, responsible actions in the international field, as well as, if possible, uh, we work together on, on global uh, issues. And that is the constructive and stable relationship the Prime Minister is trying to achieve with uh, President Xi Jinping and China. And I think that's, uh, that overall approach, uh, I think the two leaders uh, will uh, also Discuss as I said. I think uh, they are basically on the same page. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Ambassador. Look, I, first of all, I think that when you look at China on the economy, I mean, you look at Secretary Janet Yellen's visit there. China's in the midst of exporting their domestic economic challenges to the rest of the world. That's their leading export. You have the EU, you have the United States, you have countries like Brazil, Thailand. Everybody's taking action to protect their market from a subsidized industry where they have, because of the real estate bubble bust, because of the overhang of massive debt on the public sector side at the municipal level, China is exporting their economic challenges domestically to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world, regardless of whether you think it's the United States or the EU, but other countries, as I just mentioned, are all taking actions because they cannot become, as they have in the past, you look at the solar panel uh, as one example, become basically have their domestic industries wiped out as the state subsidized industries of China uh, lower the price artificially through state subsidies. So that's a warning sign that this is not, whatever you think you experienced over the last 20 years to China is not gonna be what you're gonna experience for the next 20 years. And it's just not the United States. Now China's gonna scream, my prediction, China will scream containment and the only reason there's some actions is because of what China's doing at home. Second is, the most persistent and pernicious act China does economically is economic coercion. They constantly use that tool to pressure another co country on the political front. Today, Japan is the target of that. Just recently, as you, after three years, China threw in the towel on Australia, which was then the victim. In the past, recent past, South Korea was the target of China's economic coercion. That's also the Philippines, this is also Lithuania. You constantly go through it. It is the most persistent and most pernicious tool. And I think we all have to be alert to what China's intentions are. Now there's one way, and there now the other way, they try to lure American business and, and, and investment. I would say that reminding everybody that the, you know, you have also a situation where people are being arrested in China. You have national security laws. Any country, any company can be a target if they decide. There's not a rule of law. There's a rule of one, and that means you're at risk at any one given time. And so I think we're going to be upfront that whatever happened in the past, you can forget. That's how we're going to act. And I think that's and, and it's again, what's happening. And what China's doing is isolating China from the rest of the international economic system. Mm -hmm. And it is a defense of the rule of law. Yeah. 
Yeah, in the report we released last week, we identified this issue of overcapacity and dumping as a principal challenge that the United States and Japan are going to have to cooperate on. So. Yeah, but I want to correct. That would be true if Brazil wasn't taking action. The EU wasn't taking action. Thailand wasn't taking action. It is across the world, people, and countries rather, are taking action to protect their domestic economies and domestic industries from a set of actions that don't play by the same rules. And, that is, and China's trying to do that because they have other massive domestic economic challenges, so they're exporting their problems to the rest of the world, to the rest of the world. And our experience out of COVID is <laughs> you can't export that anymore. Cannot happen. That ha you have to go resolve that in China. You have to build a, a domestic consumption market. You cannot export your economic problems to the rest of the world. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, let's turn a bit to uh, anticipated outcomes to the extent that you're able to talk <laughs> about them. I know you don't want to steal the thunder of leaders uh, in the Rose Garden and, and elsewhere. But um, if, if I could, maybe we could first talk about the defense side of the relationship. There's been a lot of. Uh, reporting about possible announcements related to command and control, related to cooperation under AUKUS, other forms of, of defense industry and technology cooperation. Um, welcome whatever you're able to say about these, but, but sort of stepping back, how do you conceptualize kind of the, this next step in U.S.-Japan alliance defense uh, cooperation? How should we think about the things that are coming? Um, Ambassador Yamada, may I start with you on, for this one? Yeah. You know, again, I, I, I don't go into the exact deliverables of, of the leaders' meeting. And actually, we are still coordinating. <laughs> so, so I cannot be. Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I cannot be specific. If you want to win at the table, say it here and then there. <laughs> so so uh, the, I don't know whether we call it next stage or not. But uh, yes, we are in the process of uh, coordinating our defense policies and, and uh, you know, all the measures more deeply and more closely. And Japan's national security strategy issued a couple of years ago uh, clearly uh, demonstrated Japan's strong commitment to dramatically enhancing our defense capabilities, including uh, introduction of strike capabilities and also uh, establishment of joint operational command uh, by the self-defense forces. And as your Armitage 9 report uh, indicated, that uh, our con two countries are working together with a clear understanding of the importance of closer coordination between our two countries, how to coordinate our command and uh, control structure as we establish uh, that joint uh, operational command. And also, uh, we are uh, talking about the importance of enhanced cooperation in utilizing uh, our respective defense industries, you know, including uh, the uh, production side as well as maintenance side of the defense equipment. And, and so those are, those are the, uh, some of the issues the Prime Minister and the President will discuss. But the general trend you asked is to further uh, deepen our coordination and, and uh, cooperation on, on these uh, defense policies. Mr. Well, I'm going I'm to be quick on the security side because uh, my friend has covered it. But I would say one thing that I think should be noted are two things in the security front. One is Japan's budget, defense budget, created a new joint operation command center. It initiated, therefore, for us to take a fresh look of something that's been around for the United States since the 1960s. And we're in the midst of the process saying, OK, is the structure we had for the last 60 years really right for the next 60 years? And the answer is no. You don't need that. We have different challenges today, multiple different challenges. You have a different Japan. And so that inspired, initiated, and kind of got past the bureaucratic inertia that can exist to ask some fresh questions. And we're going to have a different structure. What shape that takes, that's not going to be resolved. But the fact that it's, it's going to happen mm -hmm. is without a doubt resolved. Mm -hmm. How it takes, what the very particulars are, which are very, very important, have yet to. The second piece is, I don't, this doesn't, it's not breaking news. We have a lot of obligations to the United States across the globe. One of the big challenges we have is our military-industrial 
capabilities are not equal to the challenges and commitments we have. Japan, because of a set of policy or policy of banning uh, defense technology exports, changing that policy recently under the leadership of the uh, of, uh, Prime Minister Kishida and the government, opens up an uh, a, a industrial capacity of Japan to be part of a solution that is a global challenge in a way that you can't say that just for Europe or any other country that's been part of that. This is a whole new capacity and bringing it in. So it's going to have a 180 degree look. Where can we co-license? Where can we co-produce? And look at every aspect of that. Then the two things I think that uh, will not, uh, will get covered, but I think is really, really important. The last two years, and uh, all the teasing aside, I am interested in space. I think it's an incredible opportunity uh, from a lunar exploration. But we've had five agreements between the United States and Japan. Gateway, Artemis, Mars, space Sta International Space Station, and the framework. In this uh, gathering, we're going to uh, build off of, the, of an incredible found structure and foundation. Uh, Administrator uh, Nelson, I was about to call him Senator Nelson, because how I know him, but has been an incredible partner, been, visited Japan, and you will see a major contribution in the collaboration and partnership, and should not be lost. You know, just a couple months ago, Japan became the fifth, only fifth country to land on the moon and continue to send very valuable information back from the moon uh, and, have, and, a key, and achieve a great technological feat given the technology that they have in the sense of how close they got to the exact area of the target. So space will be a major, major component. <clears throat> but also one, it's minor but kind of a big deal, which is there we're going to look about placing a major kind of climate human disaster mm -hmm. depot center. So, uh, Japan had a major earthquake recently. Uh, obviously, Taiwan just had a major earthquake. But you have typhoons. You have all types of challenges. But to get all the tents, all the water, all the medicine in a major central location, all there kind of in a warehouse, so we can deploy anywhere in the region a rapid response capability humanitarian assistance to climate and uh, human, uh, rather, natural disasters. First ever kind of created. And it will be, uh, in my view, a real contribution given there's going to be more, not less, of those type of uh, kind of natural disasters that we have to respond to collectively. Mm. Exciting. Such a wide range of things. Mm. I know you're doing a lot of work on the technology promotion side, too, Ambassador. So maybe we can come back to that in a minute. But Ambassador Yamada, maybe now I'd like to ask you about the Prime Minister's speech to Congress which is a significant part of this visit. I believe it's on the morning of the 11th. Comes as Congress, as Ambassador Manuel noted, is just coming back and re-engaging on the question of assistance to Ukraine. Uh, what messages can we anticipate the Prime Minister delivering in his address? Um, Prime Minister was asked that question earlier today uh, at the Haneda Airport. And what he <laughs> said was uh, he would like to underscore the strength of Japan-US alliance and also convey to the Congress uh, what kind of future we would like to leave to our future generations and, and what should we do together to achieve that uh, shared future. Um, the Prime Minister Kishida, as you know, spent some years uh, when he was a child in the United States. So his message uh, will be a message from a longtime friend and close friend uh, of the United States. And he will emphasize his deep respect for the leadership role the United States has been playing in the international uh, arena. And also uh, emphasize that Japan, as a global partner of the United States, is ready to work with the United States shoulder to shoulder on various global issues we are faced with. And, and the strong, reliable global partner of the United States. And also, Prime Minister will talk about uh, transformational changes taking place in Japan on um, security policy as well as economic situation. So I hope that the Prime Minister's address to the joint uh, meeting of the Congress, which is only the second ever uh, by a Japanese prime minister uh, to impress upon the American people uh, that Japan is a reliable and determined global partner 
of the United States. That's great. Thank you. Just two more questions for me, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, I want to come back to the trilat on the, on the back end of this oh. visit. Um, and Ambassador Manuel, in your piece in the Wall Street Journal, you, you talked about this emerging lattice work mm -hmm. of relationships um, among uh, moving away from the bilateral hubs and spokes to a more minilateral construct. Mm -hmm. um, uh, welcome your thoughts on what we can anticipate from this trilateral meeting, but also the other relationships that have become so important as well, whether, whether there will be discussion of further steps with the ROK, further steps with Australia, for example. Um, this lattice work has a number of pieces, uh, and I suspect it will be very much on display. Since we're going to Congress as a former congressman, I do want to, uh, I, I know okay. that wasn't the core question, but they are coming back after two weeks, and the speaker noted that they were going to deal with the uh, assistance. Also, uh, Ambassador Yamada said earlier, which I want to stress in his opening remarks, the importance of trust. Uh, and there's this line, or line of thinking in the United States, or by some, that we should really just focus on the Indo-Pacific or China or challenge and leave kind of Europe or not deal with, Ukraine's not the primary. You don't have that luxury as a superpower. The credibility of the United States, the credibility of the defense of democracy, the rule of law is on the line. And he will be speaking to Congress at a critical juncture when Congress, and this is, he won't be the only, I don't know what he'll say, but I don't know what, I know what he's communicated both in real resources and in words before, and other world leaders have spoken to this. So this is a critical, I mean, for the security that we're building, the lattice work that we just talked about, for the credibility of it, the United States credibility as a central piece in partnership with our friends, Japan, in the area, it will be advanced when we, step, when we double down on what we've committed to, which is the rule of law and the defense of it. And you cannot separate the transatlantic over here and the Indo-Pacific over here. There is a single strategic sphere. So that's one. Two, um, I think that, uh, I think, way that to think about this, you have an energized quad. United States and Japan are key players in that effort. You have a historic meeting uh, in Camp David in August, uh, led by President Biden, uh, and also led by uh, Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon, to sta not only stabilize, but to strengthen, deepen the roots about a kind of real commitment on a trilateral basis to face multiple challenges there. And then uh, the first ever leaders meeting uh, between the United States, Japan, and Philippine leaders. Uh, both the United States and Japan separately have very strong bilateral relationships on the economic front, the development front, the diplomatic front, and the de defense or deterrence front. Bringing that together into kind of a comprehensive whole. That, the whole strategy here if a, kind of in a larger context. When like China tries to use economic coercion, it's to isolate Japan. When you bring the lattice together, or the, the lattice-like system, it's not to isolate China, but to realize their attempt to isolate others, either on the economic front, the deterrence front, the development front, doesn't work. And the hub and spoke system that we built up over the years worked, but it's not relevant to this moment. And it's a major transformation. The constant in it is the United States and Japan. And building off of that foundation, and I've said this before, but I really believe we're leaving an, an era of alliance protection. And we're emerging into an era of alliance projection. Not just as the ambassador said, and I agree with this, for, foremost in the region, but it's a global alliance built on a set of values and ideals that we both share and a sense of leadership and responsibility to protect those values. Yeah, this emergence of connections among U.S. allies and partners is sort of the signature development. I mean, it was always siloed, and yeah. it was us in yeah. the center. And that's why we got called the Hubman Spokes. But it's not up to the challenges and the kind of also strategy that's been deployed by China to isolate a, a South Korea, isolate a Japan, or isolate an Australia, or isolate the Philippines. That lattice work is a there is a real response to that strategy of isolation. 
last question and we'll open it up that I feel obligated to ask. So I think it's <laughs> fair to say. Is that your way of clearing your throat? Easy, <laughs> <laughs> it's transition. Um, I think it's fair to say this is a time of political uncertainty in both the United States and Japan. Right? President Biden is engaged in a presidential campaign. Prime Minister Kishida faces his own political headwinds and uh, the prospect of an LDP party election in September. How should we think about the durability of the things that are going to be announced on Wednesday? Uh, Ambassador Yamada? Uh, <clears throat> this time I do want you to go first. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, I, I think there is a, a bipartisan support for the strong strengthening, further strengthening Japan-U.S. partnership in this country. And also in Japan, uh, there's a consensus uh, on the need to continue to strengthen you know, our bilateral relationship. So whatever happens in either country, I think uh, our two countries' partnership will continue to grow. That's well, right. I, think the, uh, I think it's a complicated answer. I don't think it's a yes or a no. So I'm going to slightly, just slightly, uh, uh, this is what a good diplomat is, and this is what a bad diplomat is. <laughs> this is the perfect diplomat. This is don't copy what, don't do what I say or do, OK? Yeah, tell your kids this is dangerous. No. Uh, so here's what I would say. I mean, and there's a le uh, Chris, there's a kind of a lesson out of the trilateral relationship. You know. Take that um, trilateral relationship with Korea in Camp David. One of the pillars of China's strategy in the Indo-Pacific was that the United States, Japan, and Korea could never get on the same page. That changed fundamentally in August at Camp David. I think one of uh, the National Security staff members of President Bush 43 said, "We." desperately wanted to have this, how significant this moment was. It was in our strategic interest. Now, I believe there's real roots, meaning this is getting embedded in the cultures and in the institutions, not just on the defense or intelligence side, economically. I mean, just went to the baseball game of the Dodgers and the Padres in Seoul, South Korea. Padres have a Japanese player and a Korean player on the team. It just tells you that it's a national pastime, but that has, but other things are happening. When we announced at uh, G7, Tokyo, Univer Tokyo University and University of Chicago, we put 150 million through IBM and Google for quantum computing research. And then at Davos, Seoul National University joined that quantum computing partnership. So it has roots and it's getting spent. But I would also tell you, having been part of this at an intimate level, there is a trust where a Prime Minister Kishida, and I can't say speak to President Yoon, but I will take the liberty, will go a little beyond the comfort zone because they have a trust not only in the United States, but the leader of the United States. And if you do something to fray that trust, everything you're building is not constant. You're building all the time. You're strengthening all the time. You're doubling down all the time. Nothing is static in politics. And I know it comes as a rude shock, but diplomacy is politics. And so the idea that somehow elections don't matter, they do matter. They matter domestically. They matter internationally. And so uh, I do think there's some longevity that goes past the time of the three leaders. But there's also things that unless you build off of it, rather than abandon it, it doesn't mean it can stand the pressure of that. So I think it's, the truth is, to be honest about the answer is, there's real kind of interests that our roots are being put down. But it's early enough that if, unless you're building on it constantly, it will atrophy. And we all know that. That's just what happens. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We have time for one. It was a maybe. short diplomatic career, but that was really great. <laughs> we have time for one or maybe two uh, questions. Um, <laughs> let me go to uh, let me go to Emma Chandler Avery right here. Thank you, um, Emma Chandler Avery from HS Society Policy Institute. Thanks to both of you. Um, 
And Ambassador Yamada, I just looked up your time on the cherry blossom run. And let's just say you're way ahead of me. Um, quite impressive. Um, I actually wanted to ask about um, this uh, rumblings of Japan outreach to North Korea that is seeming seemingly far-fetched but persistent. Um, I wonder if what Japan's motivation is in that. It seems there's some flexibility on the on the uh, from the abductee family members right now on this. Um, do you anticipate it coming up at all during this visit? And if there is a potential for any breakthrough between Pyongyang and Tokyo, could that help the United States sort of unstick this, this um, persistent gridlock with the DPRK? Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the Prime Minister Kishida uh, believes that uh, if we can ever uh, establish a productive relationship with North Korea, that will be beneficial uh, to Japan and North Korea, as well as to the region, uh, to establish uh, stability in the region. Uh, but at the same time, Prime Minister's uh, very clear principle is we, we have to see if we can resolve all the outstanding issues of concern. And the, so far, uh, the recent statements from North Korea indicated uh, that they are not ready uh, to deal with those outstanding issues of concern. So we'll see uh, how things will develop. I think uh, for the Prime Minister, it is uh, very important to resolve uh, outstanding of issues of concern. I mean, you know, missiles issues, nuclear issues, and abductions issue. So those continue to be a very important issue. Uh, for the Prime Minister, and to resolve those issues. If uh, North Korea is forthcoming, Prime Minister is ready to uh, have a dialogue with the North Korean side uh, under his direct instructions. We'll see how the North Korean side will react. Okay, great. Let's do one more. I'd like to go with, um, uh, let's, uh, with Mr. Takagi from NHK. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Uh, regarding the planned uh, U.S. steel, Nippon steel acquisition, uh, President Biden issued a statement against the plan. Uh, in Japan, this is perceived as uh, an action that may damage the relationship between the U.S. and Japan. So, uh, Ambassador Emmanuel, uh, what do you think were the reasons that President Biden publicly opposed the deal before security reviews were complete? And Ambassador Yamada, is Japan planning to raise uh, this issue at the summit on Wednesday? Thank you. Another easy one. No, yeah. Well, let me, let me say this. First of all, uh, one is the United States relationship with Japan is a lot deeper and stronger and more significant than a single commercial deal. Second, weeks before the president made his statement, he gave Mitsui, a Japanese corporation, a $20 billion agreement to build a crane factory here in the United States and replace all, replace all the cranes in all our ports. I don't know what says trusted partner better than a $20 billion endeavor for Mitsui Corporation. And third, in 2021, when Toshiba was a target for an acquisition, Japan stepped in because of national security interests. The relationship continued to prosper and grow. So, I mean, I understand the focus, but the idea that you're going to take, I don't know what the count is, 70 different parts of deliverable. We're talking about major security changes to the United States and Japan, and we're going to reduce it to a commercial deal that the two countries, or at least the parties, have a disagreement about. When you have the history of Mitsui and Toshiba, uh, as we would say in Chicago, you got to chill. <laughs> I cannot say what the Prime Minister will talk about and what the President will talk about. Okay, fair enough. Well, we've uh, really benefited from your time. This is really an historic time in the U.S.-Japan relationship, and these are two of the architects of where we are today. So please join me in a real warm round of applause. Thank you.